students here again with a new content release this time on a brief brief writing guide which is kind of a pun there but so in this video we're going to get into the specifics on the amicus brief the structure of it and how we can help you write it so beginning with this this is a brief example from cocklelegalbriefs.com it'll be linked in the description and this brief is written specifically by the southeastern legal foundation by kimberly s herman council of record at roswell georgia so uh as you can see here these amicus briefs require a lot of formalities starting off with the title page all of these formats have to be properly adhered to and exactly like how it is all these guidelines for how the formatting occurs it exists on the scotus website and state courts websites right now um, we can go look at one later if you want but as you can see here you have to list the docket number the case the petition for what it is in this case it's a writ of certiorari which is basically calling for the court case to be heard by uh, a higher court and what the petitioner oh who the person supporting the petitioner is contact information date and a like uh this thing right here is not required that's just a kind of watermark so just a brief overview on this so what we plan to help you on is in terms of these sort of amicus briefs we allow you to both have the resources to provide you to do all the formatting for you we solve all the bureaucratic problems such as uh such as submitting to the scotus and etc and we give you the expertise regarding the government and the constitution whether it's preemption the commerce clause states rights or simply categorical federalism cooperative federalism precedent stare decisis we tell you everything about this because either we think it's really necessary that the people get involved in the judiciary system promptly and actually create change just recently the supreme court ruled in favor of lgbtq rights and partly this was because of the amicus briefs urging robertson follow stare decisis and of course he was the swing vote allowing for lgbtq uh, rights for the lgbtq community and that was really significant and a great thing uh regardless you're able to support whatever thing you want to regardless will help you uh, further your political orientation to a level on the national level uh without any sort of discrimination on like what your ideas are and not adhering to anything like that we simply provide the resources for you to do so and the constitutional know-how to actually make this happen uh so now we'll go to the questions presented so the questions presented are basically the facts of the case and again this is rigid format uh, in which amicus briefs are forced to have these sections all presented in a proper order. So as you can see here, the author is describing a petitioner in a small landlord in Davenport. In regards to this, this, this sorry, it's the case in which uh, what has happened where the land, uh, where it's a local civil rights commission concluded the landlord had violated local law and the Iowa courts upheld the decision, concluded it didn't violate the First Amendment rights of free speech uh so this is uh s the facts of the case just simply unbiased what happened previously in the lower courts so next there are the quote questions presented these are sort of the things the amicus brief seeks to answer this is what the author formulates this is what they think is the most important part of the amicus briefs so here they say, was the imposition of liability for the landlord's speech a violation of the First and Fourteenth Amendments to the United States Constitution? So let's unpack this. So first of all, the First Amendment guarantees several freedoms. There's in fact five of them: the freedom of religion, uh, yeah, uh, the religion, which is the free exercise, the freedom to peacefully assemble, freedom to petition the government, 
freedom to uh, freedom of speech obviously and uh numerous others so this is the first amendment and the 14th amendment which is essentially including the equals protections clause so the 14th amendment is a law passed during reconstruction which was essentially made to guarantee equal rights to everyone and recently it's been ex like quote unquote expanded to include a uh, sort of uh women's rights uh and uh, other like other bodies rights for example lgbtq uh, community through court precedent so as you can see here the question is basically formulated by the author to state basically implying the argument which will be presented later on which is that the argument that the uh the imposition of liability would violate the first and 14th amendments and they make arguments to do uh to explain why now let's go to the second one they say, was the local law's prohibition of statements indicating discrimination based on familial status subject to strict or heightened scrutiny because its content and or viewpoint discriminatory? Uh, this addresses a different issue in uh, courts. So there is a uh, sort of idea called strict scrutiny tests where we decide uh, whether there's heightened scrutiny or there's heightened uh, sort of ability for these bodies of enforcement or uh, legislatures that actually um, decide whether or not something is in violation of a constitutional amendment and was this scrutiny good enough or was this quote unquote strict scrutiny test actually viable at all uh so that's the questions this is what the amicus brief will seek to answer and it's basically a preview of what arguments exist and remember it has to be as concise as possible otherwise the judges will not be able to actually flow this properly and they will not be able to take it into account and the better and more concise it is it's more likely to be read and more likely to be considered in their decisions next let's go to the table of contents so i believe this varies based on court level but Table of contents are required for any brief above 1,000 words. So basically, this uh, I would suggest you include it anyway because it allows the judge to move around well, and this is basically all out like a benefit for you to have. So now let's go to the table of authorities. So the table of authorities is basically an appendix per se because it's basically describing every sort of piece of evidence you use within your brief. Uh, for example, the court cases, the case law, uh, and etc. So basically, your amicus brief is not meant to be your own story, or like it can include that, but it's not just meant to be a pathosy piece. It's supposed to include precedent from the past, it's supposed to include legal scholars' opinion combined together to create sort of Evidences build with your interpretation of these evidences to formulate an overall argument. You should find the evidence that supports your view, argue how the precedent set by this goes in your favor. And what is precedent, do you ask? So, precedent is a really important term in courts. It's basically an idea that whatever the courts say is a valid interpretation of the Constitution and this precedent will be applied to various other laws, making them unconstitutional or constitutional, and star, the principle of stare decisis upholds that this is the common law of the land, where we establish a common law interpretation of laws and a common law interpretation of the con uh, con uh, Constitution, sorry, which affects us profoundly to occur in the future. For example, ruling on a law, for example, Lopez v. United States, the precedent set by that law is the, uh, the specifically stating the facts of the case and the opinion. The opinion is what's written by the uh, uh, select justice on the majority side of the ruling decision that basically goes into the common law. So if the opinion said, quote, under Lopez v. United States, the, fact of, uh, the facts of the case were that uh, a person brought a gun to a, uh, uh, a gun to a gun free zone. Uh, near a school and basically they argued in court that this was an overstepping of the uh, sort of Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause. Congress uh, regulating him bringing a gun to a gun-free zone was an overstepping of the Commerce Clause. 
So the state side argued that no, it's not because obviously the obviously the edu- education department uh, like ends up spilling over into commerce where they are the future commerce people. But no, the guy argued that no, this is a super contrived link scenario. Instead, what's the point for regulating my thing? That's not federal jurisdiction, that's state jurisdiction. And the court ruled in favor of him. He's right. And what did what precedent did this set? So the precedent that was set was the federal government has a limited interpretation under the Commerce Clause. So this basically set the stage for future politics and cooperative federalism, where the state and federal government is forced to work together and the federal government can do unilateral uh, unilateral uh, sort of laws against the state government. It established the need for federalism in the future and it has widespread impacts. So that's just an example of precedent and uh, Stare Decisis and how it applies to other laws, such as that gun-free zone uh, law. Uh, Now let's go to the interests of the amicus brief. So the interests of the amicus curiae briefs are basically a place, uh, is the place where you describe your, quote, biases. You have to describe what your organization is, why you have an interest in this, and why you want to do this. In terms of us, we will be writing, we are a nonprofit organization that aims at, like, empowering the public. And next in the second paragraph, you would describe how you specifically, it applies to you, where the sort of pathos comes in, where you want to do stuff to protect, say, your your legal status under DACA, or you want to uh, preserve the rights of H-1B, or you want to help the international students, or you want to preserve the civil rights movement to exist in the future. Anything like this, anything you want, it's, it's under your interest, of course. And remember, concise is key. This is especially true in the summary of the argument. So in the summary of the argument, you basically summarize your argument in no less than one to two pages. And these pages have like humongous margins written in like century 12 point font, which is sort of the law, I guess. Uh, so here you really concisely sum- uh, summarize your argument, name dropping these sort of cases and case laws and laws as you go that support your argument without actually describing them in depth. You do that later on. Instead, you summarize your argument really quickly. You show your link scenario. You show why the precedents are important. You show why they have to make decisions. this decision based on previous court cases of lower uh, lower level courts. And you explain this. Uh, completely, you explain each single one of your contentions, you explain your subpoints, and then you go on to your scenarios. So the argument page proper. So you, first of all, in the summary, the summary st- sets the stage for this. So in the summary, when summarizing in a manner explaining why the courts should make X ruling is in a logically sound manner, basically establishes each line of argument that you'll make and you have to go in depth in each single one of the arguments that you described previously subpointed in a perfect manner so as you can see here we have cont- a contention subpoint uh, model so first you have the first contention the case presents an opportunity for the court to clarify speech regulations that do not address commercial harms d- deserve full first amendment protection so Essentially, what is this contention saying? So this contention is saying the case presents an opportunity for the court to address commercial harms that serve the First Amendment protection. So basically, the first argument is based is the First Amendment protection argument. The A point is a specific court case, how this applies. And uh, the per- paragraph, they basically summarize, their, uh, they basically use multiple evidence pieces and just a line of reasoning for that. So you can just remember it in a specific style or a specific format. Claim evidence warrant. That's the general, general uh, manner. So the claim is the claim you're making. In this case, it's the contention level argument. And next is the evidence, usually case law or law review or just laws like United States federal code. And the warrant, which is the arguably the most important part. 
which is the reason why the evidence matters. It's usually uh, why it sets a precedent impacting certain problems in the future. So that's the warrant, uh, the warrant for why it affects something. And uh, with this simple contention style format, dividing your arguments into subpoint is also really useful for the judges to actually flow your arguments well. And of course, remember your footnote, uh, not here, remember your footnotes. Remember your footnotes. It's important for author qualifications and uh, and uh, other things which are from other passages which support your arguments without the need to actually putting it in the thing. Regardless, the footnotes still impact your word count, so that's uh, so there's like no benefit it could provide from making your entire thing just fully footnotes. So as you can see here, it's simply a formulation of evidence, what the evidence says. The reason why it supports your argument, the precedent it's set. For example, here in the case of Virginia State Board of Pharmacy, uh, Pharmacy versus Virginia Citizens Consumer Council Incorporated, quoting the Pittsburgh Press, it said, Congress wrote in depth about public interest elements of commercial speech, stating as a particular consumer's interest in the free flow of commercial information, the inter interest may be keen, if not keener, by far. They say the court found that the federal, uh, the free flow of commercial products and the communications of where, how, and why they're made was indispensable. So basically, they're using this evidence to end, a, end up supporting their argument on their contention level. So as you can see here, they are trying to support their argument by saying no line between publicly interesting or important commercial advertising and the opposite kind could ever be drawn, clearly supporting their argument. Yet, with that admission, the court explains holding did not dispense with categorizing speech as commercial and non-commercial. Again, another sort of warranting for their contention level debate. Next is the B point, a completely uh, like a completely separate argument under the contention, which they again argue for. As you can see here, it goes on following the same format, multiple subpoints of the contention. Uh, next is second contention, which is uh, another argument to why you should favor X interpretation or X form of ruling for the uh, law and the uh, which of which type of opinion should be written to set a specific type of precedent for the future. As you can see here, it follows a very strict format and again, conclusion, which is definitely short because you can run out of words very, very quickly. So this is basically the brief structure of writing the amicus curiae brief. It's a short, really good brief for us to practice our role in the government. And it's quite simple to be honest, just learning the constitution is one of the best ethical acts of education one can ever do. And especially in AP government, if you're a student of this, I would highly encourage you to use your skills and do this. And in fact, we, uh, we're aiming amicus briefs to actually make this part of a required portion of our AP government in uh, in the in the basis to actually make this happen I'll be I'll be proud and we're hoping to get it there but thank you guys for watching this video and I'm hyped I think it'll be really good for the future and if you want contact me at yashdeet at gmail.com that's y a s h D-E-E-T at gmail.com, linked in description. And also, Ethan, his email will also be linked in the description. Uh, thank you guys for watching again, and I'm really happy. Just like, you don't have to subscribe, of course, but just share it with other people. Uh, we'd be really happy if you did that.